to realize that it was important to get some baseline data back then. Um, I don't see Bob Warner here today, but he, he was very instrumental in, in making that happen. So we have a, a, a picture now of what things um, were like and we can compare them to, to more recent conditions. Um, our, one of our objectives was simply to, to document what the prevailing water quality um, was, to update the, the record and to uh, document trends that were occurring, if there were any. Um, and more recently, we've been focused on collecting data that would support development of a nine element plan and the watershed and in lake models that would, um, <coughs> would be used to support such a plan. So um, the monitoring we've done on behalf of the town of Skinny Atlas um, was done in 2007, 8, 11, 14, 17, and uh, last year, 2019. <coughs> Um, also, we were involved in a, in a project with Charlie. It was an EPA grant where we deployed um, a profiling buoy in the lake in 2002, 3, 4, and 6. So we do have some older, very detailed um, profile data from those years. The focus of our monitoring is very widely over time, early on. Um, we focused a lot on the optical properties of the lake, um, physical patterns, fabrication, <coughs> dissolved oxygen, those sorts of things, uh, tracking trophic state metrics, total phosphorus, chlorophyll, secchi disc has been a, a primary uh, target. And more <laughs> recently, we have done some uh, depth profiles of nutrients, um, organic carbon, and focus some on the algal community composition um, using a floral probe. And then just last year, we made some uh, microsystem, some algal toxin measurements as well. <coughs> so in 2019, our, uh, our monitoring was done at um, a single site, uh, Town of Skinny Atlas Site 2. Um, over time, there have been up to four sites going down the, the main axis of the lake. Um, we found out pretty early on that, that there are not um, really substantial longitudinal trends in water quality, at least in the main lake. So we focused on this site, um, done some vertical profiling with a seabird to get detailed uh, profiles of temperature, conductivity, um, radiance, that sort of thing. Um, also your standard trophic state uh, metrics. With an eye toward modeling, um, we picked up some, some carbon measurements as well, particularly vertical profiles of both carbon and phosphor species. Mentioned looking at the algal community with the with a floral probe and the toxin measurements as well. So this plot shows some uh, temporal seasonal trends for the six years that we monitored monitored the lake. Secchi disc is in the upper plot, total phosphorus in the middle, and chlorophyll A concentrations on the bottom plot. Um, in general, we've seen pretty consistent uh, secchi disc measurements over time. Uh, phosphorus varies a little bit year to year. 2019 concentrations were on the low side. Um, and chlorophyll concentrations have increased both in 2017 and in 2019. However, it's important to note that all of these metrics are consistent with an oligotrophic um, trophic state. Uh, so that has not changed. Uh, looking at some patterns of these trophic state indicators, the function of precipitation, uh, we've noted that uh, chlorophyll A concentrations tend to increase in wetter years, and uh, secchi disc tends to decrease. That makes a certain amount of sense. Increased nutrient loading, increased phytoplankton abundance, lower water clarity. Interesting that we have not seen a similar pattern in um, total phosphorus, however. These 
are some profiles taken in 2017 when the uh, harmful algal blooms were most severe in Skinny Atlas Lake. The upper uh, row of plots is from a site um, near the village of Skinny Atlas, in the north end of the lake. Um, the lower uh, panel is from a, a, a main lake site further south. And uh, this pattern seems to be generally reproducible, where we see uh, quite low concentrations of uh, cyanobacteria in the main lake, and they increase as you move north. This is a pattern that we've seen in other Finger Lakes as well. Um, hypothesize that that's related to um, uh, just movement, windblown um, concentration of um, a lake-wide low concentration of cyanobacteria in certain portions of the lake. Uh, one of the missing pieces here, one of the things that we, we uh, don't know or didn't know is what the, the vertical distribution of phosphorus is in Skinny Atlas Lake. Uh, measurements have always been taken near the surface as an indicator of trophic state. And with the invasion of uh, zebra mussels and more recently quagga mussels in deeper portions of the lake, we were interested to see if there were noteworthy increases, particularly in dissolved forms of phosphorus, total dissolved phosphorus and soluble reactive phosphorus in the, in the, uh, the lower layers of the lake. Um, they're particularly important because those are the forms that are available to phytoplankton for growth. Um, so we took some measurements <coughs> at uh, about 20 meters uh, around the thermocline and um, down around 80 meters at the bottom of the lake at our monitoring site and really didn't find any um, organized patterns, really no evidence for significant uh, release of dissolved phosphorus um, from the sediments. That doesn't mean it doesn't occur, it just means that in our monitoring we don't have any evidence for it. This is in contrast to Cayuga Lake, which after the invasion um, of quagga mussels, soluble reactive phosphorus concentrations doubled in, in Cayuga Lake, from about five micrograms per liter to over 10. Um, we were anticipating seeing something similar here, however we did not. All right, uh, moving on to <coughs> tributaries. Uh, we've monitored Shotwell Brook, um, since uh, annually since 2016. That uh, monitoring again was done um, for the town of Skinny Atlas. Um, our objectives were to develop uh, estimates of stream flow. As uh, Charlie mentioned, uh, the tributaries to Skinny Atlas Lake have not been gauged at all until, until just recently. Um, so you need to know how much water is coming in in order to develop loading estimates. Uh, we also wanted to um, get a continuous record of water quality in the lake by deploying um, multi-sensor sons in the stream to get 15-minute measurements of temperature, conductivity, turbidity. And we're also interested in documenting patterns of turbidity and phosphorus in the lake um, at base flow, but, but more importantly, during um, significant runoff events. So Shotwell Brook um, is a, a small stream. It's only, uh, it's less than 6% of the total skinny house like watershed. It's uh, located at, uh, roughly a mile south of the village of Skinny Atlas. Uh, significantly, it's very close to the uh, drinking water intake. And so it is of um, great interest to folks like Rich Abbott um, um, because of that proximity and because it's a known uh, source of turbidity and also phosphorus, particularly during major runoff events. Uh, this is... Um, a, a rating curve that we developed using data from 2019. Um, so 
So we went out a number of times and made measurements of the cross section of the stream and velocity um, and, um, and estimated flow um, from those and a pressure sensor that we deployed in the stream that makes 15 minute measurements of um, essentially water depth or pressure. Um, got a nice fit, really nice fit in 2019. This is the data for the, the four year record. So um, for this stream, we have um, a pretty nice uh, idea of what the, the flow to Skinny Atlas Lake is. Therefore, it allows us to calculate loads if we have some concentration data. This is a time series from 2019 showing uh, the stage or flow, if you will, um, with precipitate, daily precipitation data um, um, coming from uh, the top vertically there. Um, some interesting uh, seasonal patterns, but with four years of this type of data, we have a really good understanding of how Shotwell work responds to, um, to precipitation, um, both on a, a daily basis and seasonally. These are high frequency measurements of stage and temperature conductivity and turbidity. Again, 15 minute measurements. Um, have four years of this type of data and two years of this type of data for Grout Brook, Bear Swamp, um, and Harold Brook as well. Um, so um, it gives us a, a, a really good understanding of, of the temperatures of the streams when they come in. That can be important in modeling because that dictates at what depth the stream will enter. Will it enter in the epilimnion and deliver nutrients where there is light for phytoplankton to grow, or do they plunge um, and those nutrients are, are therefore not immediately available? Looking ahead to this year, this, this program is started again with funding from the town of Skinny Atlas. One of the, the, the major data gaps is we don't know much about loading from tributaries during the winter and spring. Um, as it's turned out, most of these programs haven't started until June. Um, so in order to fill this gap, we're monitoring four tributaries that are located within the town of Skinny Atlas um, for all of the parameters that would be useful for modeling. Um, different forms of phosphorus, nitrogen, carbon, um, solids, dissolved reactive silica, etc. So that will be nice. It'll fill an important gap. We're going to focus on runoff events and major snowmelt events. In the last two years, we have expanded uh, the tributary monitoring program well beyond Shotwell Brook. Um, these are some uh, photos <coughs> of uh, some of the different uh, streams we have um, been sampling in 2018 and 19. Um, really aim to capture a range of conditions. You can see the, the streams at, at low flow on top and um, during higher flow at the bottom. Uh, many of these streams would be characterized as very flashy. Um, and much of the loading occurs in um, really a small number of storms during the year. So similar um, objectives, um, one, to develop estimates of stream flow, which uh, were unknown. Um, again, to deploy SONs in the stream, to provide continuous, uh, continuous record of water quality, and to collect samples to support estimates of material loading to the lake, really with a focus on nutrients. Uh, in 2018, this work was funded by the Skinny Atlas Lake Association. Um, it added three major trips uh, to the program, Grout Brook, Bear Swamp, and Harold Brook, um, to bring the total to four. And in 2019, um, as part of the Nine Element Plan program, funding from Department of State supported that program as well as monitoring of five minor tributaries and an upstream site on Bear Swamp.
So I got a little ahead of myself there. I think we covered that. Um, um, just want to make the point that this monitor included all of the uh, analytes that would be necessary to support uh, water quality modeling um, for the lake. So here's a, a just a Google Earth image of the watersheds that we monitored um, the last two years. The major um, streams. Watersheds of those streams are in kind of the, the blue color here. Um, Grout Brook and Bear Swamp down at the south end. Shotwell Brook and Harold Brook more toward the north end of the lake. And the five minor tributary watersheds are highlighted in green. And you also see a green area in Upper Bear Swamp Creek. We were interested in that because we were seeing kind of high dissolved phosphorus concentrations in Bear Swamp thinking they may be related to a large wetland complex in the upstream portion of that watershed. Uh, the parameters we measured are listed there, and in the four major trips, we deployed um, a pressure sensor to get 15 minute gauge for stage measurements, um, as well as some, some water quality. So just focusing on the four major trips, we're looking here at their, their area, um, is the, the column on the, the far left, and then the percentage of land use um, devoted to pasture and hay, cultivated crops, forest, developed areas, and wetlands. And we see that we have quite a range of land use just in these four watersheds, from Grout Brook and Bear Swamp that tend to be highly forested, to Shotwell and Harold Brook, which have quite a bit more agricultural uh, land use. Uh, want to finish with a, a slide summarizing some 2018 phosphorus data. <clears throat> Panel on top is total phosphorus followed by total dissolved phosphorus and soluble reactive phosphorus. Um, these are based on 18 samples collected from June to December of 2018. Um, did capture a number of storm events. I believe four of the 18 were collected during major storms. Um, what we see are the highest concentrations in, in Shotwell Brook and the lowest in Grout Brook, and that corresponds pretty well to the land use pattern. If you want low nutrient concentrations, you want a forested uh, watershed, and, and wherever we look, uh, we tend to see higher nutrient concentrations in watersheds that either are either highly developed or have a lot of agricultural land. So that's uh, what I have for you. I'll finish with a picture of Onondaga Lake. <laughs> um, and I'm happy to take any questions.